Healthcare triage is no stranger to dissecting studies about processed foods, but we were recently alerted to a study linking them to depression. And since we haven't dissected that yet, that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. While we are no proponent of processed foods, we're also not proponents of making serious assertions about what they do to your health when we don't have the evidence to do so. While I stand in my belief that we should get as much of our intake from whole foods as possible to avoid seriously overeating, I'm against claims about their effects on things like cognition and sometimes cancer. Why? Because the studies that make those claims don't provide the evidence to support them. They're correlational, meaning we can't infer a causal effect. They examine so many factors between various disease outcomes and food components that statistics can't be reasonably used to examine at all. The methods they use, like self-reported food intake, are often unreliable. The media presents the results in deceiving ways, and the list goes on. But getting to this new study, as reported by news outlets like CNN, eating nine or more portions of ultra-processed food per day results in a 50% increased risk for depression when compared to people who eat four portions or less. It's often hard to verify these things, since the actual study is rarely cited, but we did some sleuthing and found the original source. Published this year in JAMA Network Open, the study did indeed examine consumption of ultra-processed foods and incidents of depression. But did it really find a 50% increased risk? And did it fall prey to the issues of the studies before it? Let's take a look to the research. This study analyzed data from nearly 32,000 females who did not initially suffer from depression. The amount of ultra-processed food they ate was determined via a survey given every four years over the course of about 14 years. Incidence of depression was determined via self-report of diagnosed depression and regular use of antidepressants, which was the strict definition of depression, with the broad definition not requiring antidepressant use. Looking at the results, we did see a 50% increase reported for the stricter definition of depression, but there are some major caveats. That number is, of course, the relative risk, which is a classically misleading number. We've done an episode on relative versus absolute risk, and you should definitely go watch it. Using the strict definition of depression, just over 2,100 cases occurred among the nearly 32,000 subjects, or just under 7%. And while we care very much about 7% of people suffering from depression, this study suffers from statistical limitations that make even this number iffy. The sheer number of factors you have to include to account for food intake alone just makes the math unreliable. And there are other factors at play that can't be well accounted for. And this is where the issue of correlation comes in. On the off chance that there is actually a relationship between processed food and depression, this study doesn't tell us anything useful about it. Is the food causing the depression? Or is the depression leading to increased consumption of easy to access, extremely delicious food? In addition, participants classified under high intake of processed foods had a bunch of other stuff going on, including an increase in other conditions like diabetes and a decrease in regular exercise, both of which have a relationship with depression. And about those methods, self-report measures are problematic because memory is unreliable. Asking people to correctly recall what and how much they ate for lunch last week is a gamble, let alone asking them to accurately remember daily consumption for the last four years. There's just no way those data are accurate enough. Also, when they examined specific food components of processed foods, they found only a correlation between artificial sweeteners and depression. That changes the conversation. And in any case, the data on the dangers of artificial sweeteners is weak. But I digress. Bottom line, this study adds to an overflowing pool of faulty studies linking various diseases with various foods, all telling us very little in the end. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode on the evidence behind plant-based diets. We'd really like it if you liked the video. Subscribe to the channel down below. Consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show, make it bigger and better. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillahome, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.